Hi, everyone. Welcome to Dear Banff, the show for PR and marketing pros like you. Hosted by Beck Bamberger of BAM. BAM is a communications agency that believes stories move the world. We move stories forward for technology-driven brands that challenge, change, and create entire industries. Today, on the Dear BAM podcast, we're talking with Clarissa Horowitz, VP of Marketing at Treasury Prime. She is a strategic and forward-thinking senior marketing and communications executive that turns startups into category leaders. Clarissa has global experience across industries, including enterprise software, security technology, financial services, and financial technology. Let's dive in. Welcome, everyone. This is Dear Bamp, the podcast for PR marketing pros such as yourself to figure out the endless and crazy problems that we all face. This is the show for all the problems and all the questions we cover every single week when we come on board here. So thank you for joining us. I'm Beck Bamberger. I run BAM, which is an agency that works with all venture-backed technology startups, and then also One Pitch, which is a platform that helps everyone to do better pitches to help our media people, media friends out there. So that is that. And today, very happily, coming from the fintech arena, Clarissa Horowitz, who's senior marketing and communications executive, but particularly the VP of marketing at Treasury Prime. And we're so happy to have you, Clarissa. Thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Yes. And you were just mentioning to me, your mom's visiting you straight from Canada because now she can come here. Yes. Yay. And I know that we're all having these post pandemic, I guess we're not really through it yet, but these moments of being able to see people that we really love and haven't, you know, hugged in in a while. There you go. I'm happy for you. And it's always good to have family visit. Yay. Especially maybe not. It's always good to have family visit. It's good to have family visit when it's been so long. How about that? I think that's more accurate. Perfect answer. Perfect. Well, first, Clarissa, could you tell us a bit about Treasury Prime? What is it all about? So there are these fabulous new banks out there that we call neobanks. And you think about Chime and you think about Dave, and they've done this phenomenal job of addressing very specific customer segments and providing really compelling banking services to them. The thing that many consumers probably don't even realize is that these are not actual banks. And what they've done is they've actually built a company on the infrastructure of a chartered bank. And that's a wonderful way to do it because it saves you having to build all of these banking services or having to spend years and up to millions of dollars getting a bank charter. You also have the benefit of being able to offer FDIC insured accounts. So what you start to see happening out in the world is these wonderful synergies between banks that want to grow and fintechs that want to build businesses on these banks' infrastructures. Now, if you know anything about banking systems, they're horrible, they're old, they are just absolutely painful to work with. So if one were to say try to do a direct implementation into a bank system, it would be about as much fun as sticking razor blades under your fingernails. So what we do is we come in, we win a partner bank, we integrate and wrap all of their systems, and we build an API layer on top of it. So what we've essentially done is we built a a plumbing layer and we're the pipes that funnel the information via API calls between the fintech and the banks. Excellent. And that is so needed because there's a lot of crap in fintech, just as you're mentioning, that I don't think, wow, there's a lot to do in fintech. People who are like, oh, you know, this is solved, that is solved. I'm like, oh, no, no. There's many problems specifically in fintech to solve, but in supply chain and various other parts. I just think when I don't hear too often for people in tech, but when you hear maybe an outsider say like, oh, but everything, like things are good. I'm like, no, 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 no. There is so much work to do and so many antiquated industries It's not even funny. And actually scary things in the sense of lack of security, lack of our defense. I was just on a call with the VC today about biohacking for as like a cyber threat. And I'm going, yeah, God. Anyway, there's lots to do. I'm glad you're at Treasury Prime doing a good (laughs) fight. What are you most proud of in accomplishing in the last, say, one year or so? Well, on the business front, I'm really proud of helping this company grow. So I joined almost exactly a year ago. I was employee number 14, 
And as of today, Ooh, we're now at 40 people. We're mm-hmm. on track to be at 60 by the end of the year. So the growth is phenomenal. And I've basically single-handedly for the first six months, and then with the, the help of a, a small team, built a marketing function that didn't exist before I came. That's good. On the personal front, I'm most proud of having become a somewhat better surfer in the last 12 months. <gasps> what? Where no, are you not surfing? Good. Not oh. good, just somewhat less worse than I was before. <laughs> okay. And are you doing that in like San Francisco area? Yeah. Out uh, south of San Francisco in mm-hmm. Pacifica. I When the, the fires were really terrible last fall, And we couldn't even go. So we were trapped in our houses and we couldn't even go outside of Northern California. And I think you guys were having the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. In Southern California, Mm -hmm. we made the decision as a family to relocate to Hawaii for a couple of months. And part of the ulterior motive I had with doing that was like, wow, this would be a way to really have some dedicated access to surfing. And so now I'm back. The water is a whole lot colder but still getting out there, went out a couple of times this week with my daughter and really enjoying it. Good for you. Wetsuit like, how thick is it? Because it's chilly. <laughs> yeah, I have a, it's, it's what's called a 4-3. It's built for surfing. Yeah. And then even better than the wetsuit is the booties. That makes all the difference in terms of retaining sort of core warmth. Mm-hmm. In my very brief time of trying to do a triathlon, which I did complete, but because it's so frigid, your feet and hands, there's nothing like the agonizing pain of frigid hands and feet where you can't even, you can't even like feel anything. So I'm glad you got the booties. No, absolutely. You know, that's the toughest part when you're doing something like a triathlon. It's like when you're, you're getting distracted because some part of your anatomy is just too cold to function properly. It's, it's really hard to, to keep the performance level you want. Gosh, well, I'm glad to hear it. And maybe your is your mom going to go surfing with you? Is that not her thing? My mom would really like to see us go surfing before she leaves. And it reminds me of when I was in college and she came to visit me over the summer. And she refused to leave until I gave her a ride on the motorcycle I had gotten about a month or two earlier. Oh, my gosh. Clarissa, you're such a fun daughter. You surf, you motorcycle. Very classic Californian, I'd say. It's a life for somebody who grew up in Canada, about as yeah. far away from California as you can get. <laughs> yep, yep. God. Okay, so we like to talk about storytelling before we get into some of the questions. What ways, what means are you using currently to storytell? Yeah, and you know, there there are a lot of people who are probably going to give wonderful suggestions around formats. But one thing I was thinking about yesterday is I was preparing a deck to present to a round table of banker people. And one of the things that I realized was missing from the way I had been telling stories up until now was I hadn't set up my market thesis for Treasury Prime. And I feel like You know, in in Silicon Valley, you see a couple of problems with the way people tell stories. You'll have a lot of companies and their spokespeople who just launch right into what is it they do and how are they different. Yeah. You have people who do a better job than that and they step back and they talk about the problem they solve. But what I was really trying to get to was what are the really big tectonic shifts that are happening that are positioning the market for us? And so I felt like I had that at my last couple of companies and I could articulate that really well. And then by setting the stage with that, I was in the position to get people to agree with this high level positioning and what was happening in the market. And that made it easier for them to follow me as I went through the rest of the narrative. Mm -hmm. And so kind of the two most important points that I, I led with yesterday were Traditionally, banks have viewed growth as being driven by the deposits that they hold. And what's happening right now is that control of the clients for the U.S. deposit market is shifting from banks and shifting to fintech and embedded finance companies. And we believe that the chartered banks 
who lean into this shift will play a crucial role and they'll reap tremendous benefits. And then I can go on to talk about how banking as a service and specifically Treasury mm-hmm. Prime bring both of these different parties together in a way that delivers measurable value to all parties. Mm-hmm. Is that going well so far, would you say? It was really well received. It's sort of that big picture setting the stage where it was really funny, actually, because when I I finished, one of the comments was from a a guy at a community bank saying, you just stole my story. That's exactly what I've been talking about. And I was like, well, great. (laughs) Oh, nothing like that. Those words took or like you took the words right out of my mouth. Oh, my gosh. Good. As communicators, it makes us feel like we really thought hard and analyzed correctly what we needed to say to this particular audience. I mean, this is this is what we yeah, do. That's excellent. Way to go, Clarissa. Well, let's get into some Thank questions because we got some. Here we go. First one. Dear Banff, my client is working with a really small budget, which obviously limits what we're able to do for them from a PR standpoint. They are working towards more funding, but we anticipate this lower retainer will be around a bit longer. How can, hmm, this is a broad one. How can we make the best use of their time and hours while we're in this waiting period? Oh, we've had this before. We've all been through this. And I was actually thinking back to when I was working at Spark PR and I had a client come to me. They were a 35 person company in stealth mode, just getting ready to launch. And they had a budget of 5k a month, which is, as we know, very, very good. Yeah. And so at that point I was running a PL. So I, I had a fair amount of leeway to be able to take on any client I wanted to. It was just on me to make it work. And so what I did was I, I had a level setting conversation as we started working, which was like, you don't have a whole lot of money here. So we need to be very, very focused. What are the business goals? And when I asked that question, I actually got quite honestly, a much better answer than I expected. And Mm -hmm. the company had one client at that point, they needed to win nine more customers. And that would automatically trigger their series B funding from their existing investors. So it was like, okay, great. We need to go be in places that you're going to go find nine more customers. So in this particular case, it was a company called Mobile Iron, and they were selling what was then called mobile device management software to IT departments. So I said, look, what we're going to do is we're going to focus heavily on the IT trades. This is not the time to care about the Wall Street Journal. That is not going to have any influence on the people who are going to be most involved in the spying decision, and we need to focus where they are. So we did that and we just doubled down on the IT trades. We started getting lots of great coverage there, ultimately got where we needed to go. And then because we were so successful with that layer, we were able to build our profile in higher tier media as well, ultimately making it to business because we'd established all of this credibility with those key vertical trades. Now, one of the other things we needed to make sure that we did was like that we took these great media placements that we had and we made sure that they were being used in the sales cycle because that was going to add a whole lot of credibility to companies that were trying to decide whether it was worth taking a risk on a super early stage startup that seemed to have very interesting technology, but who knew how long they were going to be around. Mm -hmm. I love your mention of trades and focusing there, but more importantly, starting with getting to the brass tacks of what is the business position? What is the objective? Is it to get us to the next round? Let's impress investors. Is it we need to hire 20 people, so we want to talk about our emphasis on our culture, et cetera. Since you have so little to work with, you do not have the luxury of, let's pitch four different story angles about this, this, this. No, you, that's what you get with a bigger budget, so you could be pitching multiple story angles over, let's say, a period of time. But if you could laser in and get to that pinpointed objective, then the full focus 
for the story pitching, just like you, your great example, Carissa, can be just on that. And unless those business objectives change, you're going to stick to that for your little dorky budget for right now. That's what we're going to do. Exactly. And so the outcome was really interesting because ultimately we were so successful with our program for a year. And this was having spent a grand total of 60K over 12 months that the largest and most established competitor at that time came to our agency and said, we want you to pitch our business. And oh, by the way, we have 10x the budget that Mobile Iron does. Oh, wow. And so interestingly, you know, the I obviously could not have been involved in that pitch because that would have been a conflict of interest. Yeah. But what ended up happening was the agency actually did win that larger client. We had to resign Mobile Iron and Mobile Iron created an in-house role for me that they hadn't been planning to do for at least a year and a half. Hmm. So it was kind of a nice ending for all of us. That is nice. Oh, it could be happy endings to all these problems that we see. As a last thing, okay, something we've done a handful of times, if this is of any help to this person, now I don't know the breadth of their team here, but one consideration is if the business objective is just not ripe for a media push, it doesn't seem compelling enough, you have nothing really pitch worthy to emphasize and focus on that goal, well, how alternatively can you use storytelling? Can you do it by content? Is there a social media campaign? Is there a thought leadership initiative you can do instead? Should you maybe dump some of that in video production to do something that's more on a, a platform, maybe social media, maybe YouTube, something like that? So just other considerations, because maybe PR in this case is not the solution and it could be dedicated elsewhere. I love that point because what, what you're trying to do when you're you're in the, you know, agency side is, is you're trying to deliver results and you're trying to be a good steward mm -hmm. of your client's investment with you. And sometimes that you're absolutely right. That may mean saying, you know what, you shouldn't be spending any money with us for a couple of months and maybe put it towards something else. Also or, that, yeah. Or just let's save it up and bank it because you've got a launch coming up. Yes. In a couple yes. of months, and we want to put all of our efforts into that, and let's not be distracted by little things. Mm -hmm. So true. Let's see our next question here, Clarissa. Dear Bam, my team and I have been working on a ton of product updates that will be revolutionary for our customers. Mm -hmm. Revolutionary. Yes. We're also gearing up for a complete rebrand and relaunch of our website. I want to make as big of a splash around this as possible. How do I pitch this to press? What do I need to get them as excited about this launch as me and my team are? Oh, I have bad news for this person, but go ahead, Clarissa. I suspect we probably agree on part of this. So I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, I have yet to meet any reporter that cares about a rebrand or a relaunch of a website, unless you're like Amazon or Airbnb. Yes, yes. And hopefully at that level of Airbnb, you don't have... 17 articles about why the hell did you change your logo to that weird phallic yes. thing. But exactly, <laughs> exactly. That is the type of news that gets picked up for a large company that does something a little, you know, questionable from a branding perspective. I totally agree here. I think generally speaking, that's true. And I said, are there any exceptions to this? And I think if you were doing something that is so out there and so avant-garde in terms of design, you might be able to get design press to carry it, to cover it. But would that even, would that hit your target audience, right? Like, do you even mm -hmm. care? And mm -hmm. then the other angle I came up with is if you were piloting brand new technology or some like amazing use of machine learning or AI, like think about when chatbots first launched. Like that was actually that was with regards to a website, but short of those angles, I, I don't think most people care, but if you're able to get things covered and you can, you know, if you can get the product updates covered that are revolutionary, then you can provide images that could showcase the branding. Perhaps since these are revolutionary for your customers, which is great, focus on capturing the use cases, the case studies, the thrill, the how did this impact them stories. 
not only can you use that, of course, for case studies, for your own marketing and for your biz dev, but that could perhaps be juicy media fodder, perhaps. Yes. But you're going to have to dig in there and go like, wow, did this truly impact them on a scale where it's like, wow, they cut their emissions 47% by using our new technology. The bigger picture, oh, they were able to save the lives of 200 and something patients. I don't, we know, we don't know the industry here for this particular person, but what are those juicy stories? Because that's maybe where the press happens and could happen. I agree. I think when you connect it to that end user experience and how it's changing, that's really powerful. And one thing I've done as part of that type of pitch is I've really tried to make it very clear for people how things were done before and how they're done now. So for example, it's like before this existed, you had to roll a truck to this pipeline to figure out where you were having a blockage to be able to solve it. And now because everything's being monitored digitally, you can just pull it up on an iPad, find the exact look, you know, it's, it's that kind of contrast, right? Mm-hmm. So that is what I would say for that. Good luck with the website. Hopefully, you know what? Okay. One last thing, not for media, but maybe it'll really excite your customers and they'll go like, wow, look at this hot new website and even compel them more to use their, your next product launch. So if you maybe take it in a lens from that. Yeah. You know, somebody who, who gets to sit across both communications and marketing, like that's a wonderful thing for your customers and your prospects. So mm-hmm. put out a newsletter, do some great things on social media. You know, there, there are a million ways you could make it entertaining. I don't think it's necessarily press worthy, but I think there's a lot of other mileage you can get out of it. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Not even speaking of like what you could do in your email blast, maybe at a conference, all various things. So I think just PR is not the answer in this case. Think of all the different ways internally, marketing wise, you can drive this. Yeah. And you know, another piece that I think sometimes gets overlooked is like internally, people get incredibly excited about this stuff. So so you can can do something that really helps, you know, bring the rest of the company along with this. Mm -hmm. Focus there. Okay. Last question for us today, Clarissa, we have, oh, well now who knows if this is too relevant. We're, by the way, for everybody listening, we are taping this in the end of July here in the States. So let's see how this happens. Let's just pretend everything's hunky-dory and we could take it from that perspective. Okay. Dear Banff, I want to host a media dinner in New York City or DC at some point this year to deepen relationships with key reporters in those markets for my company's executives. Is it too early to think about in-person media events for Q3? Should we wait until Q4 to be safe? What other COVID-related considerations might come into play here? I kind of appreciate this question, but it's also more like a CDC question than a, <laughs> than a PR question. And because we're getting such clear and actionable information from the CDC these days. Oh, yes, exactly. But we could speak to events and actually, well, you kick it off, Carissa, and then I had something that just happened live today related on this. Sure. So we're actually planning to be at three in-person events in the fall as So far, everyone is full steam ahead. The first one is taking place at the beginning of September. So my theory in general is I think people are dying to get out and start meeting again. And so I've I've certainly been thinking that this may be a great time to start doing media dinners again. I'd love to hear your take. Mm Mm-hmm. So on the AMA that we just had today, which is our version of an Ask Media Anything, or or AMA, but it's Ask Media Anything, there were two reporters who did say to the question, well, how do I make a relationship? Like, do you go to coffees? Like, do you, can I cold email you? You know, and a lot of the commentary was like, no, don't cold, uh, we don't want cold emails. But it was said, oh yeah, you know, happy hours, dinners, coffees, on occasion I'll take a coffee. And I double tapped into the dinners we used to do quarterly. I can't even believe we executed this much, but we would do a quarterly media VC dinner in SF, LA, and New York City. This was obviously in pre-pandemic times. Once we got them really rolling and down, like we always knew our house that we did them at, we knew our caterer, like we had it down to a science. So it was pretty easy to execute. It wasn't like, oh God, that's, you know, 12 events a year that we need to like pump out or something that are distinct. It was really on rinse and repeat. And I will say, man, that was the most helpful for relationship building 
because there's something about a meal and coming together and sitting down in an unstructured way, by the way. It wasn't like, we're going to hear a presentation for an hour. Here's your piece of bread. No, it was just, hey, we might throw out like a, a table topic you know, for people to just get into, but more of like a personal interesting one, not a industry related one, for instance, those were the best. So for this person who's thinking of a media dinner, yes, the appetite <laughs> is certainly there. I think it's just a matter of the timing right now because things are up in the air as it is. Yeah, exactly. And so one of the things I was thinking about is with some of these events, does it make sense for me to coordinate a media dinner or a happy hour before they start? If people are already mm. thinking that they're blocking their schedules for this, that could be a, a nice way to do it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, another thing, I hate to say this to this person, but this is what we're thinking about is, okay, 2022. Because Right now, again, as we're sitting here recording now, we got the Delta variant and these things. And God, there's always something massive in the world that can happen, although I think we have not seen something at this scale. But plan things out. So we're looking at, okay, what could be our cycle in 2022? Who could be our partners? Who could be our sponsors like we've had? Okay, what houses can we do? And we always like to have like a, fa a fabulous private home that's hard in New York, but you know, to fit maybe 25 people all together. And there you go. So maybe for this person, think about next year, as much as I hate to say that. Well, and, and then there's the, you know, do an audit, like send emails yeah. to people you know and just find out what they're thinking rather than make an assumption. Yes, yes. Because that can also be a wonderful way because, you know, I sort of feel like media relations is exactly like sales in the sense that you are always looking for opportunities to get in touch with somebody when you have something of value to bring to them. <laughs> yes, of value, emphasized. <laughs> Absolutely. And so I think that this is an opportunity where you can reach out, you can say, I'm exploring this. Is this something you'd be open to around perhaps one of these two dates? And you can use that if they indicate that they're interested or maybe they're, they might be, but aren't sure you can use it as an opportunity to just say, what kinds of stories can I bring you? Or, Hey, would you want to do a zoom coffee with an executive? It just, it, it's a way of cranking that door open. Mm -hmm. Oh my, I miss the dinners and all the fun stuff. I will say I did have one week in New York city earlier this month and it was like, the world was back and I did all my New York things and I saw people and I hugged people and all those things, but maybe we're not going to be having that for another time. Oh man. So we'll see. Clarissa, thank you so much for being on today. Those are all the questions for now. We won't take more time because there's so many problems to solve, but that's all we got for right now. And thank you. And I hope you hop in the ocean later today or get out there. <laughs> I hope so too. But thank you. This has been an absolute blast. And I, I love the opportunity to think through these kinds of questions because yeah. they, they make me look at my own programs more closely. Oh, that's also the point. Gives you ideas. Well, thank you again, Clarissa. Take care. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Dear Banff, the advice podcast for PR and marketing pros like you. Our show was created by BAM, a PR marketing agency headquartered in San Diego and New York City. The music you're enjoying today was composed by Tiffany Dizon, produced by Daniel Kessner, and played by San Diego Symphony's Art of Milan. If you have a tough PR and marketing question you'd like us to answer, write to us at bamtheagency.com forward slash Dear Banff. Don't forget the F. If you'd like to get notified of our latest episodes, subscribe to us wherever you listen to podcasts and review us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts.